This week, we speak with Clint Gibbler from NCC Group. In the news segment, we review announcements about a container escape and an OS for containers. Supply chain sins sync more user data, maybe some metrics to measure, and maybe some to spurn, and more. Stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. As the world of software-driven everything becomes a reality and development cycles speed up, sales teams are taking a new approach to application security, one that enables security teams to scale by empowering developers to integrate security into their development workflows and tool sets, all while giving security teams the visibility and control they need. Sneak helps software-driven businesses develop fast and stay secure with a developer-first solution that seamlessly and proactively finds and fixes vulnerabilities in open source libraries and containers. Learn more and see the solution for yourself at security weekly.com forward slash sneak. Nearly every business today relies on mobile applications, yet the vast majority do not adequately secure them. Once downloaded, mobile apps escape your control outside the secure network perimeter, thus making them easy targets for hackers. Enter GuardSquare. From the makers of ProGuard, GuardSquare integrates transparently and seamlessly into the development process, adding multiple layers of protection to Android and iOS applications, and effectively hardening apps against both on-device and off-device attacks. Request a demo today of GuardSquare at securityweekly.com forward slash Square. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to Application Security Weekly. This is episode 100, recorded March 16th, 2020. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hey, John. Hey, Mike. How you doing? It's, uh, I'm up here in the quiet Seattle. Uh, it's really quiet outside, so I hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy. It's pretty much the same here. Hopefully everyone's doing well, staying healthy. It's quiet here in San Francisco. And for our announcements, we'll also hear about InfoSec World 2020 was originally scheduled for March 30 through April 1st, 2020 at the Disney Contemporary Resort. This conference has been rescheduled for June 22nd, 24th due to COVID-19. Security Weekly listeners still save 15% off the InfoSec World Main Conference or World Pass. Visit securityweekly.com slash ISW2020. Click the register button to register with our discount code or the schedule button to sponsor a micro interview. Cyber Security Exchange Day hosted by Ocean and the Pell Center was originally scheduled for Wednesday, March 18th and has currently been postponed. New date is still TBD and we will keep you posted as soon as we hear more. Clint Gibbler is a research director at NCC Group, a global information assurance specialist providing organizations with security consulting services. He's helped companies implement security automation and DevSecOps best practices, as well as perform penetration tests for companies ranging from large enterprises to new startups. Clint has previously spoken at conferences including Black Hat USA, AppSec USA, EU and Cali, Besides SF, and DevSecCon Seattle, London, Tel Aviv, and Singapore. Clint holds a PhD in computer science from the University of California, Davis. Want to keep up with security research? Check out TLDRSEC, Clint's newsletter that contains summaries of artisanally curated top talks and useful security links and resources from around the web. That's TLDRSEC.com. And with that intro, hello, Clint. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, partly we have you here because we talked a couple weeks ago about your presentation at AppSet Cali. And uh, Matt, John, and I were pretty, um, we liked quite a bit of it um, because it was quite wide ranging. I think you got just under, as we'll, we'll let John uh, bug you about this, but I think you hit 199 slides <laughs> for your presentation. But it was it was all about 
different ways of approaching security for teams. Um, and it started off with um, something as simple as what is default security or, or you know, making things secure by default. But before we get into some of those specifics and talking about the presentation itself, I just want to kind of ask you, what brought you to create that presentation? Or you know, what, what was that journey into pulling all of that information together? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, I have to confess, it wasn't actually this uh, sort of massive planned vision. Uh, how this work <laughs> actually started is I was um, uh, grabbing drinks with a friend and uh, he started um, giving me some details about what their company did um, to do like continuous code scanning or secure defaults and things like that. And we just sort of rabbit holed into it. Uh, and I thought it was very fascinating. Uh, but I didn't think too much of it. And then I think the next week I was chatting with a different friend from a different company and we similarly sort of rabbit hole. And I saw that there was this interesting overlap between what different companies thought made sense. But there was also some, some unique tidbits uh, that they did uniquely differently. Um, so I, I basically started this quest to ask all of my friends at different companies as well as just interview clients and other people I knew uh, to try to get like a state of the art in terms of what do we all agree on, uh, what's some maybe novel interesting things that someone else hasn't done, uh, and essentially take all those ideas and combine them into one uh, talk as well as watching a bunch of other people's talks and really trying to create sort of a, a playbook of like what are people thinking about and doing um, across many companies and industries and things like that. Um, so it started as an accident, but then it became sort of a, a quest for me to search uh, all the different things people are doing in practice. Well, I think it comes through that you talk to, as you just said, a lot of different companies across industries, because the presentation wasn't just about, here are three things specifically to do, you'll do these, and this works for everyone. Um, you did actually um, boil it down to some very straightforward advice, but the advice was more of strategic ways of, of approaching um, uh, application security. One, for example, being focusing on the developer experience. Um, you know, not forgetting that developers actually have to run these tools. Um, that those using uh, figuring out what is a secure default was another one. Um, so that really showed showed through. I guess maybe let's start to dive into a couple of these areas. And I want to plant for our listeners to to say this question out loud as well, making sure we try to find out what are the areas where the context works for companies that have small and and or or small security teams or security teams that are on one, you know, the lower end of the maturity scale, um, as well as where might it be a bit a better context for larger teams and and with the with bigger budgets, they can attack um, problems in different ways. So with that said, um, let's talk about just picking one, um, some of the fundamentals of security. You did spend a lot of time talking about um, like vulnerability management and pen testing and bug bounties and um, when and how to spend time on each of those. What, what were some of the conversations that led to that? And what, what can you tell us a little bit more about how would you, you know, when you're working with companies figuring out penetration testing for them, <clears throat> what do you start to look for? Yeah, uh, in terms of what I chose to focus time on, um, a lot of it was kind of an evolution, to be honest. I didn't really mm -hmm. start with, um, vulnerability management, um, that sort of just came up the more I thought about it. And I found like, okay, well, like when I first started, uh, I was very like tactically focused where I was like, okay, what are these specific things different companies have done that are very like technically interesting? Um, but ultimately because those can be very specific to a, uh, technology or even culture, um, an ecosystem of a company tactics don't necessarily apply or make sense, uh, at other companies. So gradually I found my focus over time becoming more strategic in terms of what are the principles and ideas behind these tactics, because a tactic might not work for your company, but the same principle, for example, um, making secure defaults or enabling developers to do their work faster and better, but also more securely. Like these ideas apply anywhere. Um, so that was one shift of mine uh, over time. But specifically for vulnerability management, um, I found that there's a lot of, well, I guess the question many companies have is, uh, I have limited people and limited 
person time and limited money. So what do I do that actually like makes sense and measurably improves my security bar? And I think there's many things you could do, but it's unclear for your company without uh, essentially having some data, having some metrics. And essentially you need vulnerability management to do that well, right? You could say, oh, I think this project sounds awesome, uh, but without um, some of the data to back it up, you might spend a lot of time working on an area that uh, is not your most important need. And even if you do a good job at it, you can't measure and, and prove that you did a good job later with it, right? Because uh, you can't necessarily say, oh, this reduced you know, this class of vulnerabilities 20% because you're not measuring it, so you have no idea. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting ideas in the talk, but really if you're not measuring how you're doing now and how you're doing in the future, you just have no idea if what you're doing actually works. Um, and to be honest, this is no different than say, you know, marketing, uh, tracking, you know, your different ad campaigns and your click-through rates in your funnels or sales or things like that. I think historically, um, security has been a little bit of like shoot from the hip and not necessarily as measured, I think as other more, um, mature in some respects domains within a company. Um, but I think in terms of vulnerability management and quantifying risk and things like that, we are as an industry, I think pushing a little bit more towards uh, measuring how effective we are. Um, yeah, so I've been chatting for a while, so I'm going to stop, but I know I didn't quite <laughs> chat about pen testing and bug bounty yet. No, that's good because I sort of brought us into it at the, you know, not necessarily from the smartest way to enter this, but one of the, the common questions in the sense of, you know, I'm a security person, my company is building software, I have no idea what the bugs are in it, you know, what bugs are in, inside it, how worried should I be of it, maybe I'll turn to pen testing or a bug bounty, but you're kind of pulling out those, those points as saying, well, what should we, we should be figuring out what to measure in the first place. And just the number of bugs isn't necessarily the smartest thing. So maybe we should pull back then and sort of taking me as our security guinea pig on, on, on this journey and saying, sure, we could start going through pen testing to find cross-site scripting, but riffing on your concept of secure defaults and the parts where you're talking about that, what are some better ways that you've seen companies approach just not having to worry about a whole class of vulnerability? Yeah, I think um, you can get a lot of value and wins by just doing very simple things. Um, for example, if you're using a uh, modern web framework um, or modern like front end library, those are gonna handle a lot of things for you. Um, and if you're using like a, an ORM or object relational mapper, uh, instead of writing raw SQL statements, then you're generally not going to have a uh, SQL injection, and then the web framework is ideally output encoding for you, so you don't have cross-site scripting. Uh, it's probably doing some session management for you. Um, it's probably uh, helping you with um, CSER tokens, although with um, same site cookie flags, this is maybe less of an issue. But the idea is choosing sort of technologies and approaches that eliminate whole classes of issues such that you don't even have to worry about them. Uh, another example is, um, Many times companies are compromised via targeted phishing. Um, and you can train people to not get fish, but I think ultimately uh, in some respects that's a fool's errand because it's, it's always going to happen. Um, NCC does a lot of red teams for different companies. And I asked a friend of mine who's uh, very senior in that practice, like, hey, in practice, how often do you get in via phishing? Um, <laughs> and he said 100% of the time. Um, <laughs> And, and this is like in small three or four week engagements, this isn't like determined attacker over many months. Um, but the reason I say that is if instead of say, uh, having a culture of downloading attachments and opening them, if you could perhaps more often just share uh, documents in Google Drive and open them there and nobody's actually downloading um, Excel documents or Word documents or various things that could have macros and opening them, then you just, uh, eliminated that whole class of issues, which is one of the most common ways companies are compromised. Um, admittedly, that's very hard in many companies because, uh, for example, accounting and other people's workflows may be very, um, like they need to do that. Um, but the idea is like, what are single decisions or technology choices we can make that eliminate whole classes of issues? Um, you know, turning 2FA on on everything, not very technically complex um, in terms of like a protection or like detection type thing, but it's like you get a huge amount of value from that. Um, yeah, so those are just a couple of examples. 
Yeah, and I like that because it's it's focusing on the underlying the 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 outcomes of the behavior rather than the behavior itself because the whole web is predicated on here is a link to click on it. There's no such thing as the um you know the the evil bit. There's no evil bit RFC <laughs> for URLs where people say oh just look for this and don't click on those. Um, and I think it speaks to two. You, you, you're really focusing, I think, in, in good ways on getting to um, classes of vulnerabilities. One of the other ways that security teams may consider targeting classes of vulnerabilities might be diving into the, the source code and doing some SAST or some DAST. What's been your experience and how have you seen companies either perhaps make mistakes that are something to avoid with using SAST tools or um, thing, ways that they've adopted it well and that other, t other companies might uh, emulate? Yeah, one thing that um, surprised me a bit um, is many companies are having a lot of challenges getting significant security ROI from SAST and DAST. Um, and I, <laughs> it's hard for me to say that because like automated bug finding, um, especially static analysis, is like one of my favorite topics. I just find it very fascinating. Um, but I was on a number of projects with different companies where they found that the tool that they were paying a lot of money for, um, they weren't getting significant ROI from it because uh, it was complicated to hook up into CICD. It took mm. um, a long time to run. Uh, they didn't necessarily have the internal expertise or time to tune it appropriately. And I think fundamentally, pretty much every SAST and most DAST tools as well need to be tuned to have high signal results. Um, like if you ask like security engineers who built those tools, like 100% of them say like you need to tune them to get them to not be that noisy. Um, it's not out of the box um, going to do that. So I think... This is also sort of a bigger trend I've noticed. Um, I think historically we've spent a lot of time as an industry on uh, identifying vulnerabilities, you know, building very complicated tools that can find, say, interprocedural data flow analysis and source code for like SAST tools, or that can, you know, crawl a very complex web application for like a DAST tool. But many modern applications, um, how they're structured as well as sort of microservices make SAS difficult. So what one trend I've noticed is sort of a, a deprioritization of complicated bug finding and instead prioritizing more, can we build, say, secure wrapper libraries that handle potentially dangerous things such as SQL queries or parsing XML or things like that, uh, and then giving these libraries to developers and making sure they use it? And then so rather than trying to identify vulnerabilities, you're instead just trying to find, are people using the uh, nice secure wrapper libraries that we built from them? So it's basically the other side of the same coin. We're trying to prevent vulnerabilities, but instead of identifying when something is actually exploitable, we're instead saying, oh, you're doing the secure way. And because I vetted the secure way, I know that you don't have this vulnerability here. I don't actually have to figure out, can attacker input get to this point? Because even if it could, uh, it doesn't matter because by construction, we've solved that issue. Um, so yeah, I've, I've noticed many companies having trouble with these sorts of tools, um, which is not something I expected going into it, to be honest. No, that's interesting. And it sounds like, too, that shift is very much like uh, it, it can be a lot easier to identify very obvious and glaring anti-patterns than figuring out, are these other patterns okay or not? Have they been vetted? Have they not been vetted? And maybe it also speaks to, um, uh, you're talking about like frameworks and cross-site scripting. React has their lovingly named dangerously unset inner HTML, um, which is just a great way to highlight that <laughs> yeah. is a very good anti-pattern. So, you know, if you lint for that and finding that, that is a really high signal to say, wait, why is this in here? Let's poke at it a bit and figure out, is it okay? Is it being actually used in a way that is not too unsafe or do we need to, to go after it some more? Um, uh, I'm going to jump around a couple different topics now, too, because I, I'm kind of moving backwards from from that predicated idea of, ooh, I have I have a whole bunch of apps. I should just do some testing and find out what's wrong with them. But we've gone back to say, well, why not just use some secure defaults, period, from the very beginning to worry less about particular classes, have some linters or some good ways of detecting very obvious anti-patterns, what you've been just describing. But even further left, I'll call that, and shifting left in the sense of responsibilities or capabilities could be doing for security is 
asset inventory and just that basic aspect of what am I trying to protect, whether it is my cloud inventory, my application inventory, um, the dependencies within my application, or even just the, the systems um, that compose the application. That asset inventory has got to be something that everybody recommends, um, but often is kind of tough. So I'm kind of curious, what can you tell us what you kind of learned there? Or what were some of the conversations you had with people in different organizations or, or how you saw that emerging? Yeah, asset inventory was another trend that I um, didn't really think about going into it, but that I kept hearing again and again. Um, interestingly, from many of the companies with the, you would think, like, uh, you know, most mature, best funded, biggest security teams, um, like your FANG sort of companies, I've heard from multiple very senior people at those sorts of companies, like, asset inventory is so hard and, and we're not doing as well as we should. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think just even knowing what your environment looks like and what you own in very um, rapidly evolving, um, continuously changing environments uh, is very hard. And I, one of the reasons I emphasized it is because um, if you are you know, a handful of security people and there's thousands or at least hundreds of developers, you can't look at every pull request. You can't threat model every story. So having uh, sort of this programmatically updated continuous view into like what new microservices are we spinning up? Um, what is our external attack service to the world? And ideally some idea of, you know, what is the relative importance of these different microservices or applications and how they connect to each other um, is very important because you don't have time to audit everything. Um, at least most security engineers I talk with, they're like, you know, Maybe if I have like 10x the team size, I could start doing part of that, um, but that's not going to happen. So really, I think the key for many things, vulnerability management as well as asset inventory is like, where do I focus my very limited time? So if you can identify, okay, well, here's all of our externally facing services. Maybe we start there because this is the entry point, or maybe we have a PCI or other very sensitive environment. Like this is where our most sensitive data is. Um, so let's look there. Um, so I, th I think the core point is like, where do we focus our time and can we gather information about our environment programmatically? Because um, if it's like manually done, it, you're, it's going to be out of date as soon as you create it. So I think starting with your cloud environment, maybe hooking into various like AWS, GCP or Azure APIs to sort of enumerate where, um, uh, what servers are you using, uh, what services from the cloud provider are you using and so forth, as well as what like code uh, information you have, like who owns which repo, how are they changing over time. Um, there's a pretty cool tool by uh, the Lyft security team called Cartography, which they've open sourced, which basically will hook into a bunch of the systems you use, use the API to enumerate like what's in there. Uh, and then visualize it in a graph database. And you can run queries based on like, what are all my externally facing EC2 instances and, and pretty cool stuff. Um, so I'd recommend people check it out. It's uh, open source on GitHub. That is cool. And I think too, the, um, and that also answered or leads to one of the follow-up questions I had too is, have you seen particular tech stacks or technology choices make this easier for organizations. So for example, you were talking about everybody's struggling with this, um, but are there aspects of adopting a more containerized microservice architecture that makes inventory any different or better, preferably, or cloud native type of deployments? Because you're mentioning tapping into APIs. Um, are, are there things there to consider the recommendations you would make for you know, DevOps teams thinking about these architectures? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I should probably give this a more detailed thought to give you a good answer. But my <laughs> initial answer is one thing that I think is interesting is cloud native approaches and companies might be easier to get in um, proper asset inventory than sort of your own data, center, data centers or on-prem because these cloud providers have uh, extensive APIs to give you visibility into what you have running. Um, whereas if you have your own sort of infrastructure code managing it, that might be additional functionality you need to build, build yourself that you don't get for free. Um, and for um, like infrastructure as code type things like uh, CloudFormation, Terraform, and so forth, um, using those I think can also make it easier to get uh, a solid asset inventory because what your environment looks like is specified in code. So there's various like security linting tools as well as you can just write your own tools for the uh, examining that code itself. 
um, which can perhaps make it easier uh, to understand everything you have rather than people, you know, manually spinning up services here and there, and there's not really sort of an authoritative source of it. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's like a specific like do this and it's easy. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that exists, <laughs> but I but I think there's things no. that perhaps can help. No, that makes sense. And you know, in looking through your slides too, talking about Terraform, um, you also referenced um, Regula and some other tools. Just be able to inspect that code to say that, or to inspect the code, which in turn means uh, what the transitive property. I'm trying to remember my math here. You're inspecting the infrastructure just to enumerate what does the inventory look like, as well as to see is it well configured or are there configuration mistakes or misconfigurations that are gonna make um, um, some security headaches down the road. Um, so, so that does tie that um, together pretty, pretty nicely. I wanted to say too, make sure that we give um, uh, John a chance to ask about um, the uh, s slide numbers here, but I think you gave this at uh, RSA, and RSA always asks for an apply slide. Um, so maybe that was <laughs> yeah. what gives you um, slide number 200. You were just holding that out when you gave this at B-Sides. But what are some of the, as we talk about like some practical things to apply with that, um, what, what might be some different ways of approaching this slide deck and what to do versus when I am a team of one or just a few, you know, a small um, security team versus maybe a larger security team? What are, what are some ways you would recommend thinking about this slide deck? Yeah. Um, first of all, you're totally right. The, uh, the action plan was uh, entirely <laughs> because of RSA's very specific guidelines that says you have to have these slides or else, you know, we yell at you. Um, that's right. But then, but then in retrospect, I was like, oh, that's actually a great idea. Um, yeah, so I think one thing that I actually didn't touch on a ton in the slides is if you're the first or maybe second security hire, I think building strong relationships with uh, engineering teams is crucially important because you don't have the time um, or the ability yet to build some of the things that I talk about in the deck in terms of like getting continuous programmatic visibility into your company's like mm -hmm. code and assets. Like you don't have time to build those yet. So if you build nice, strong, close bonds with um, engineering teams, rather than you don't necessarily need uh, all of this infrastructure, which you'll build eventually, but instead you'll have uh, developers come to you and say, hey, I'm you know, changing how our login flow works, or I'm changing how we do um, authorization, uh, and I realize I should come talk to you. you know, what do you think about this? And having developers proactively come to you with um, security asks um, because they trust you and know that you won't yell at them and that you want to help them, uh, I think is crucially important, um, which I don't talk about a ton in this uh, slide deck, but for people who are sort of building out security programs, I think is very important. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of what I would say, just like building a nice foundation, acknowledging you're not going to do everything immediately, but just say like, okay, this is going to take time, but let's get some of our basics down, uh, the fundamentals. Okay, let's sort of track vulnerabilities. You know, how serious are they? How did we find them? Um, build some capabilities to continuously scan our infrastructure so we can get some visibility and um, try to understand what we have um, in terms of asset inventory. Um, these things you can build lots of fancy things on top of. They're hard to do, but if you invest now, um, over time, you're going to see a lot of uh, value in it, I think. So I think sort of the big takeaway was, you know, there's a lot you can do and it's okay. Don't be overwhelmed. Uh, you'll get there. Just make sort of small, consistent, measured steps in the right direction. And, and yeah, I, I, I am here live. I've, I've been trying <laughs> not not interrupt the uh, conversation. Um, and I'm only on slide 123. Uh, <laughs> no, there, there's so much great stuff in the in this deck, and I think where the conversation is going right now is sort of where my head's been um, as I think about this and go through this, Clint. And um, you, you know, your site TLDR sec um, sort of goes in direction of, of where my thought is on this. It's like I'm thinking about this from someone new is in infosec or someone is new. You know, there was a thread on a um, a question on the Docker subreddit this morning about how does the sysmin team get up to speed on Docker this week. And sort of similar question around that for, for InfoSec, right? Um, 199 slides, they're really great. How does someone who is new in this space, you know, how, how can we or you or someone focus this down into, um, I wanna say like, not just so much, how do you focus down in 10 or 20 slides, but how do we, how do we minimize people having to repeat all the, you know, bumps that we've had over the last five, 10, 20 years for some of us 
how, how, you know, how do we get some, these are the things you really need to focus on. And you're sort of talking about it now, but um, do you have any sort of, you know, what, what's your, I, I suspect there's like a, a larger um, game plan in your head or sort of a, a mythical place that you'd love everyone to be. Does that sort of make sense? Is, is there sort of, you know, what, what's sort of the end, how do we get this um, to people to understand? How do they quickly get up to speed? And, you know, what's that magic wand? Yeah, that's a really good question. One that I um, don't think I have a perfect answer for yet, but I have found during uh, my work that, yeah, like all of the, um, like in this deck, there's probably uh, hundreds of links to other talks and tools mm -hmm. and blog posts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's been like hundreds of hours of work um, <laughs> to not exaggerate. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's challenging because even as I was doing this, I acknowledged that I just fundamentally didn't have time to even go into all the detailed things that I should have for this to be complete. For example, like cloud and Kubernetes and container stuff, I think didn't get as much time as probably it should um, just due to time constraints as well as my own personal expertise. Um, so Brian Payne, um, he's a senior security leader at Netflix, gave a keynote at APSA Cali 2019 um, and one of the points that he made at the end was that uh, the security industry needs to create some patterns for like, how do I do this type or this class of things securely? Um, and he sort of, as an analogous reference, he talked about um, like electricians in that industry where there are basically standards for like, if you're going to make like a, a socket or if you're going to do this, this yep. is how you do it in a way that's standard that any other electrician can understand and that you're not going to electrocute anyone. And I think having sort of like some agreed upon industry best practices in terms of like, this is how to run a secure Kubernetes cluster. If you're going to do continuous code scanning, these are some issues that you can check for with like high signal. Um, and having, I think, some standardization and sort of like security patterns, kind of like the book, The Gang of Four for design patterns, but for security, mm -hmm. I think that would be a very impactful place um, to go in the future. And yeah, one thing that I, I would like to do, I don't know if I'll have time to do this, but basically do a deep dive in each sort of category of things and then try to create like a definitive work or at least here's what everyone is saying about it. For example, how do you threat model in sort of fast moving agile environments? How do you threat model at scale? And just like, here's like 50 talks in that space and here's sort of the TLDR of like all the different things people have done in that space. So if we could have a resource like that in each core area of security, um, sort of a systemization of knowledge type thing, um, to borrow a term from academia, uh, I think that would be a great place. Um, so I think more like summary works and ideally like some security patterns that we can agree on, uh, I think would be a very nice place for the uh, community head to head as a whole. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's sort of to um, comment a little bit on that. You know, every, every year when we walk, or at least when I walk down the aisles of RSA, and you see the same vendors that have been there before, um, or maybe they've got a new product out and, and they're now trying something, um, you know, trying to go after a new market segment usually. But it's like, okay, well, it's antivirus for IoT or for container or for a virtual machine. And it's that same sort of, I guess that's sort of what I'm, I'm thinking about is how do we boil that type of stuff down into, okay, there's a new technology out. Say it's um, e-bikes. Okay, well, when you think about e-bike security, as you just said, a threat model, um, how do you deal with malware? How do you inventory the things? There's probably like, a collection of five or 10 basic things where we can say, here's your sort of top jump off points. And then from those dive down into it. Hmm. Yeah. I like that sort of like for this area, here's the types of things you probably have to consider. And then here's like the top two or three best resources or sort of action guides and how to do that. Uh, I like that idea a lot. Yeah. I think well, now, a lot of it's Go ahead. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll get you that funding, John. Don't worry. I know I've stuffed on your, <laughs> <laughs> all of your ideas for next year at RSA. Um, but what I did want to say is it, it does feel like it's pulling us back, I think, in a good way, full circle in the sense of these, what are these good patterns are also, I think, somewhat synonymous with secure defaults. Um, so talking about a good front end framework that is very resistant to cross site scripting makes it very hard to make a cross site scripting vulnerability or even just having an XML parser that strips out um, a lot of unneeded features or just disables those features that enable things like XXE being um, so impactful by default. Um, 
And I, because I think a lot of that, too, also speaks to what you were alluding to earlier, Clint, in the sense of security team working with the engineering. And um, I would nudge it a little bit to say, rather than just be passively making it so that the um, engineering team comes to the security because security is providing that help, but security becoming actively involved with that engineering team on the problems that they're doing. Um, that 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 they're um, running into, and I think you and I, Clint, had had a conversation briefly about um, a company that was adopting fuzzing into their CI/CD process, and um, you had some really good insight on just how that idea. This isn't quite. We maybe this is a pattern of testing. Um, but this probably speaks more to security working with engineering and extolling the virtues of just incidentally what a security tool is. But if you recall how that conversation went to convince a engineering team to see the benefits of what fuzzing does for their code. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I thought it was a very interesting case study. So just to give you quickly a little bit of background, uh, there was a company that had a uh, service written in C that needed to be very high uptime and high throughput. It was taking in um, JSON data from the internet and uh, needed to do like billions of transactions uh, a day. Um, so NCC group, uh, some of my colleagues came in and their security team wanted them to uh, get some fuzzing hooked up in their CI CD. So whenever, for example, there was a new uh, pull request or a new build, um, they would fuzz it for say a week or so. And then uh, they wanted it to like automatically spit out inputs that caused crashes into like Jira tickets and assign them to the development team and sort of all this nice things. Um, so the security team wanted it, but I think what was very interesting is uh, the developers actually really appreciated the fuzzing output, not necessarily because it was finding security issues, but because it was finding uh, correctness and robustness uh, issues in their code, right? So they knew that they had a very important uh, service and that it needed to be very high uptime and deal with all these edge cases. And when uh, this tool, um, the fuzzing infrastructure, I think it was mostly AFL based, uh, could give them this uh, insight into how to make their code better, they really appreciated it. Not necessarily because of the security benefits, but because they took a lot of pride in their code and they wanted it to be as robust as possible. So they saw um, security improvements as also like a sort of quality and robustness improvements as well. Um, so I, I thought that was a, an interesting way to sort of sell security to developers in terms of, you know, this will make your quote, uh, code higher quality, more robust, um, better uptime, and all these other things that um, developers like to take pride in. Um, so I, I thought that was an uh, interesting takeaway. Yeah, I think that's a way to build that conversation so we get to what are those recommended security patterns or what are those design patterns that just incidentally cover security topics. Um, and, and speaking of which, I know we've been teasing you about the, um, the, the presentation and the slide deck, but um, we very sincerely are happy to have you on here because we talked about it for um, uh, on a previous episode, but now we've had a chance to talk to you uh, directly. And, I get your insights onto this, this content. But are we be able to see more of this? Do you have something coming up that we can um, should, should keep an eye out for? Yeah. Um, I plan to do uh, an updated version at some point. Um, actually, due to John's feedback uh, after I at Cali, I realized, oh, it, <laughs> it should be uh, more than 200 slides. I can't believe I did under it. Um, you know, I felt like such a sloth. Um, so don't worry, there are, I believe, more than that now. Um, but yeah, I think there were many topics, even in these extended slides, that I couldn't get into enough detail. So I think at some point, I would like to do a blog post that um, basically captures all these things and more. Um, no timeline on that, but probably um, expect to see updated versions maybe next year once um, COVID-19 scares go down a bit. Um, but yeah, uh, I write in sort of um, more consistent, smaller chunks, um, uh, as you pointed out earlier on my newsletter, um, tldrsec.com. So just like weekly updates of here's some cool blog posts or talk summaries or tools and things like that. Um, so yeah, talks in the future, but probably it's going to be a number of months. But I do have a grand vision one day of writing this all out into like a, a mega blog post or maybe like a mini book or something. 
That sounds awesome. Yes, and for the record, I think you're up to 222 slides that um, we've only unfortunately had 30 minutes to try to get through. So once again, I do want to thank you very much for coming and joining us. Uh, I want to thank John as, as well and want to thank all the listeners. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to return with news of the week.